I, I'm not really, this is really isn't a slideshow. Um, I, I want to answer questions primarily and, and get discussion going. And if you have anything you, you want to share with me, I'm all ears. The important thing is I, I would like to just make sure that we all know about the same thing. I don't know what you don't know. So I'm going to kind of speed through the basics. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about, can we have a, the next slide, please? The, uh, some of the identified flying objects that are out there. And, and most of what we deal with at API are identified flying, are identifiable flying objects. And uh, we'll give, I'll give you some examples of some of the more common ones. There are many other, many other types that we come up against. And then, who, then a little bit about our organization and our objectives and our approach. And then we'll go over some of the, our more interesting cases that we've had. Uh, not, so, not the easy, you know, planet Venus type cases, but the, the, some of the ones that left us a little bit puzzled. In fact, in some cases, a lot puzzled. And then how to contact us and what to do if you see a UFO. And uh, of course, I'm going to define UFO in a way that you won't, but yeah, you will see some, you may see something that you don't uh, understand in the sky, and that's fine. Probably somebody does understand it, and we'll be able to, and we can help you figure out what it was. Uh, not every case, but in many cases. So let's go to the next slide, please. So what is UFO? Well, I, go, I should go by the Heineck definition. And our definition, a modern unidentified flying object, is that it's an object or objects observed in the sky that after a competent thorough investigation, we can't identify it with any known object. Now, that is an historical context. Clearly, hundreds of years ago, most of the things in the sky, except for birds, most people didn't know what they were. They didn't know what the sun was, they didn't know what the moon was, they didn't, uh, there's a lot of things they just didn't know. Uh, they didn't know how close the stars and planets were, they didn't know um, what the aurora, what caused the aurora, what caused the comets. Uh, but now, these days, I think we have a very, very good idea of what should be in the sky. And so, we can take that and, I in most cases, make an identification. Now, I want to point out something very, very clearly, that the term UFO is not meant here to mean extraterrestrial visitors. It doesn't mean it's not that, but it's really not any pet theory. I can discuss more about my thoughts on that, but there are an awful lot of, of theories that people have, everything from demons and witches to extra, extra dimensional beings, ghosts, and, and UFO doesn't mean any of that. It just means you can't identify it. That's all it means. I should point out that a lot of the ones we can't identify probably could be identified if we had more information. But a lot of cases, just not enough information. Um, we often call those unresolved because we just, if we just knew more, we could probably figure out what it is. Today, most reports of UFOs are known objects. By most, the, the, depends on who you ask. I would say for us, it runs around 80%. Uh, other people will say it's much higher, around 90, 95%. Nobody's, nobody will ever claim that it's the majority are unidentified. This is just because a lot of people are just unfamiliar with some things that are in the sky and, and they've never seen them or they, they see them in unfamiliar context or uh, unfamiliar atmospheric conditions. And so they can't identify it. We can usually help them identify it. Next chart, please. Our working assumption is that the causes of the unexplained UFOs are probably more than one. There's probably multiple explanations. And people talk about all kinds of exotic things, and those are the interesting cases. Many of them could be highly advanced, highly classified technology. Some of them could be uh, rare or exotic natural phenomena that we just don't have a good grasp on or just are so rare that we've never been able to study them. A good example of that is ball lightning. Ball lightning is so rare and so hard to get a hold of, science really doesn't have a grasp on it yet. And, uh, but we do think it exists. And uh, psychological warfare, we think psychological operations have been played into this, and I'll, I may say more about that later. And then just phenomena that we don't have a good hypothesis for. Things that, and, and ET visitors, I think, would fit into that category. So uh, next chart, please. So I'm going to go over a brief history of UFOs. It's mostly U.S.-centric. This is a photograph I took in Utah. This is ancient cliff art. Uh, it's at least 
I can't remember how old this particular one is. I think it's probably around 1,000 years old or so. If you go up Sago Canyon, you'll see all these different cliffs with different styles of cliff art on them, uh, which were put there by different generations of Native Americans long before the white people showed up. This has been interpreted by some people as spacemen. However, I would point out that the common concept of a spaceman is we get it almost 100% from Hollywood. So we don't really know what a spaceman would look like, or even if there are any spacemen. And uh, so I think the problem is, in ancient people, we, we don't know what the difference is between the stories they told each other for religious purposes or for some other purpose, and what they actually saw in the sky. It's very difficult to disentangle that the farther back you go in time. And so, in my opinion, we don't credit ancient indigenous peoples with enough imagination, enough complex thought. And they, I believe they did have that. And this, this is probably just a very imaginative rendering of some religious uh, symbolism. And not spacemen. Next chart, please. This one is a little more solid. This was uh, much more recent, 1561, in, in Germany. And there was written documentation of this case in Nuremberg. It's one of the the earliest really well-documented UFO cases. Um, we don't know what it was. Uh, it's possible that if we had a better description, we would be able to figure it out. But uh, they did write down contemporaneously what they'd seen, and um, it was pretty odd. The painting describes, shows a lot of what they saw. Uh, it could have been some kind of very strange atmospheric phenomenon. We just don't know. But we have, people have been seeing things in the sky they didn't understand for a very long time. Let's go to the next chart, please. Now, the modern era is largely, and where the word UFO got, got coined and, and flying saucer, is usually pegged in 1947. Now, that's not the first time somebody saw something in the sky they didn't understand. During World War II, for example, a lot of fighter pilots and bomber pilots were seeing strange little things flying off their wing. And apparently the Germans were seeing them as, as well as the Allied pilots. Um, there are a few photographs that could be almost anything. This, this gentleman is Kenneth Arnold. He had one of the most famous sightings. Uh, it was a single witness sighting, which as I'll probably say more about that later. Single witness sightings are not great. But he was a pilot. He was a respected businessman. And he saw something roughly like that, kind of a boomerang-shaped thing. He didn't, he didn't call them a flying saucer, but the press got a hold of the terminology. He said they skipped like saucers, um, like they're moving like saucers, skipping on the water or something. He saw very high speed, a number, several of these things flying in formation over the Pacific Northwest. It could have been an early classified aircraft. We, we don't know. The, the term flying saucer came out of that. It's a famous case. It's not a particularly great case. Also, about the same time, of course, was the famous Roswell crash, where the Air Force put out a press release saying they captured a flying saucer. They immediately pulled that press release within hours, but it was too late. The public got the idea that, that the Air Force was on the, on the saucer trail. In the 40s and early 50s, there were a lot of flying saucer sightings by the U.S. military and by scientists. It was not yet something that you'd be ridiculed for, mentioning that you'd seen. So uh, a lot of pilots and uh, even scientists in Los Alamos mentioned, hey, yeah, well, we've, we've seen these things. They had the green fireballs out in New Mexico, which a lot of the scientists in Los Alamos jumped on that. They were really interested. And they, they actually did a really great scientific investigation of the green fireballs. We never did really find out what they were. So let's go to the next chart. This, this, I just, I, this is a very complicated history, but the Robertson panel was put together by the CIA to basically to poo-poo UFOs and to say they're not a big deal. Uh, this was in 1952. And, and established the policy that they were going to downplay them and make them look kind of silly. This panel met, and they had some distinguished scientists and a lot of military and intelligence people on the panel. Next chart, please. So let's go forward uh, to 1969, 17 years later. Now the Air Force wanted, they had been using pro something called Project Blue Book, which you may have heard of, to basically explain away UFOs. 
they wanted out of that business, they didn't want any public facing UFO investigation. They got Dr. Condon at the University of Colorado and his team to write a long report. The report is actually very interesting, but Condon's introduction is the only thing most people read, and it says UFOs are no big deal, they're not of scientific interest, and that was pretty much the end of the government's public involvement in UFOs. Condon, that, this again, this is, I'm skipping over a lot of really complicated details, but in the time between the 50s and the 60s, there were a lot of people who came into the field who were really kooky and brought a certain amount of dis disreputation on the field with hoaxes. So it was at this point already that it was really kind of a career-limiting move for any scientist to get involved with the topic. Uh, it got even more so later. So I have the next chart, please. However, some of them had tenure and don't really care what you think about them, and Harley Rutledge was one of those. He was a chairman of the physics department at, uh, I believe it was Southwest Missouri. There was a, a flap in his area. He actually did a scientific investigation and encountered these objects. He did not have an explanation for them. One of the better, I wouldn't say amateur, because he was a professional scientist, but one of the better uh, unfunded <laughs> efforts that, that have undertaken in the entire history of, of the phenomenon. And this is in 1973. Uh, there is a book about this, but it's really hard to get. The next chart, please. Uh, so let's skip forward to the 80s. Now, the 80s is where things started to get nasty. Again, the government was worried not about, uh, not about UFOs, as far as we can tell, but they were worried about leaks and in classified information. And there are people in the government that's their only job is to stop those leaks. So there, there was, in, in the 80s, there were a lot of incorrect or slightly incorrect information that came out about UFOs, sometimes wildly incorrect, other times a little closer to the truth. This is just some of the cases. Um, Paul Benowitz is probably the most famous case. He actually had a mental breakdown as a result of being disinformed by Air Force personnel. Uh, he was actually getting his information from the Air Force, so he had no reason to doubt it. There was a TV special called UFO Cover Up Live that you can find on YouTube. It's pretty funny now. Uh, at the time, people would take it pretty seriously. Uh, I recommend watching that once. It, it's, it, it's an interesting bit of history. Uh, Simone Mendez was another, uh, an Air Force person who may have been disinformed. I've spoken to her uh, recently. Uh, she doesn't know if she's disinformed or not, but she's, she did receive a, uh, what looked like a very official document that discussed detection of UFOs by NORAD. And uh, at the time, she had a top secret clearance. She um, made a mistake and held on to that document and kept it in her private possession. Uh, that caused her to lose her top secret clearance and have a, lot, a whole lot of other trouble. That was a really bad situation for her. So th that that may have been disinformation or may have been intended for somebody else and she, she intercepted it. So let's go to the next chart, please. Okay, in the 50 years since Condon, there hasn't been a lot of, and it's just, just about now 50 years Condon, there hasn't been a whole lot of professional scientific work on the folks. There have been many, many thousands of reports. I would probably say even millions of reports in, in all countries, all languages, um, many different organizations investigating. Some are good at investigating, some are not. There have been lots of volunteer organizations like mine to do the investigating. We, we know just from experience that most of the reports are easily explained in a few hoaxes. Uh, if you go onto YouTube, you'll find lots of hoaxes because it's easy to do a video hoax. But most of the reports that we get are not hoaxes. Uh, but we, we are able to explain many of them just day one. We can look at it and say, yeah, we know what that is. We have uh, a lot of charlatans out there who have exploited the public interest in UFOs for money and uh, sort of being a big fish in a little pond. So you have to watch out for those folks. And you can typically tell their claims that they make are exaggerated and very dogmatic reason. There's no doubt about what they're saying. If people have doubt and they are not dogmatic and their claims are, are conservative, I have much more trust and faith in those people. Even if I don't agree with what they're claiming. And I don't agree with them. There's a lot of people in the field I don't agree with who I think are good guys. Uh, there's other people in the field that you, you just, you can smell the smell. They're they're out to take your money. Real research funding, very low. 
it's hard to get research funding for anything that doesn't appear on schedule. <laughs> but uh, And UFOs never show up when you want them to. Since 2017, it's been clear that something has been going on with the USDOD, but it's not all that clear what it was. And there are a lot of unanswered questions, and there's a lot of TV shows, but the TV shows are not answering the questions. There's been some good research done by people like Tiger or Rogaway at the War Zone, uh, and he doesn't have the final answer, but he's got some, some intriguing clues. Um, so let's have the next chart, please. I've been sometimes called a skeptic. I don't consider myself a member of the skeptic community, but I am skeptical. Uh, and I believe skepticism is a virtue. I think if you don't, if you're not skeptical, you can be taken for a ride. Okay, so uh, we are evidence-based and agenda-free. Whatever your beliefs are about UFOs, and, and within our organization, we have people with different beliefs. It doesn't matter. What we're going to do is we're going to, we are looking at the evidence, and we know that we're going to be able to identify most of the reports, and we just, we, uh, look hard at that. And if we can't identify it, we just say it's unidentified. We don't try to line it up with a pet theory. We're now to prove that UFOs are from another planet. Maybe they are, but that's not what we're out to prove. We're out to show what the hard core data are. We want to dig out all the facts, understand this witness's story, and if we have a good explanation, we'll put it forth. And we'll give us some reality checks. And if we can't explain something, we can't explain it. Uh, next chart, please. Lens flares. We've got a lot of lens flare reports. Now, anytime the witness says, oh, I was taking a picture of some clouds or whatever, so, and when I got it home, put it on the computer, I saw this weird thing on, my, on, the, on the picture. That's almost always nothing of interest. It, it's, and the, uh, lens flares are just reflections inside the lens. Uh, and uh, you'll get different types of lens flares depending on the kind of lens you have. There's, here's some classic examples. Down here, one thing that's a dead giveaway in lens flares is there's always a little bright source in the light source in, in, the, uh, in the frame. Usually the sun, it could be the sun, it could be the full moon, it could be uh, it, even a street lamp can do that, um, depending on what the exposure is set to. The next chart, please. Uh, balloons and fire lanterns or Chinese lanterns, we get a lot of balloons. Because they just sit up there in the sky, drifting along, and they don't look like anything. People usually call them orbs, or means it's round, right? Um, <clears throat> so we get a lot of those. Uh, next one. Pareidolia. That's an interesting psychological phenomenon where people see things that, is because the human brain is a pattern recognition machine, and it's always looking for patterns. And I've noticed since the time I was a little kid, if I just looked up at the branches of the trees, I would start to see faces. Uh, just, they, would just, they would just form out of the branches. And uh, this is an example of one here. Uh, this is a, a gray alien with a very big nose. Uh, next chart, please. We get a lot of that. Um, conventional aircraft. That looks pretty weird, huh? but it's actually just planes lined up, uh, cargo uh, Military cargo planes lined up to land uh, in Alaska. Uh, this is one I took. And if you just didn't look at it real closely, you would say, what is that? It's a kind of, I guess, flying saucer. But it's actually just an aircraft. Uh, and I've got lots of pictures like that. Uh, next chart, please. <clears throat> hoaxes. We do get occasional hoaxes. This is a photographic hoax. This right here. When I first looked at that, I said, that is a classic flying saucer. But I looked, I looked much harder at it. And after a lot of investigation, we concluded that this and the other pictures that were sent of the same, uh, the same object were a hoax. And what, what they think, we think they're doing is somebody standing right over here and tossing this thing into the air as hard as they can. And one of the clues was that um, the photos were only were about two minutes apart. Now, if I was saw you, I'd be snap, 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 right? Two minutes apart. Wow. And, and they were numbered sequentially, which suggests that they were getting up there, taking one picture, and let, cut, bring it down, taking the object, throwing it again. Um, so, uh, yeah, we, we concluded, and we're, there are other reasons why we thought it was hoax, but that, that, 
those are those are hoaxes, and we never did get a good chain of custody on those anyway, so we couldn't have concluded much else. Uh, next, next question. Next slide. Okay, who are we? We formed here in Annapolis, um, 2011. Uh, we were never a UFO club. We never aimed to have a lot of members. Our purpose was to investigate. Everybody, everybody's a field investigator. So I am, and everybody else in the organization is. So it's a small volunteer investigation team. And uh, our mission is to do high quality, highly ethical investigations of UFO reports. We have a code of ethics that we adhere to strictly. Everybody who comes in has to sign up to that in writing. Um, we have, we want to widely share our data with other investigators, <clears throat> but not personal data from the witness, but everything else in the case. We want to work with the wider community to bring higher standards to the field. And we public education is another one of our missions. This, this is why I'm here. Uh, and I would hope that we would, uh, you know, I can answer your question, so I'm going to stop soon and do that. Let's go on to the next chart, please. Um, I'm just going to briefly go over some of our more interesting cases. Uh, what we do is we rate every case on a probability strangeness scale, one to five. Pro one to five probability is how likely do we think the story is true? From, eh, it's probably, it could easily be a, just a made up story. Zero is a hoax. It could easily be a made up story, or five, which we've never had a five, by the way. We are absolutely, it's dead certain that this happened the way as described. Uh, strangeness is a completely different Rating strangeness means uh, this isn't that weird. Uh, it could be lots of things from, holy cow, how can we ever explain that? If I, we've never had a five. We've had some fours, but no fives. And we have an investigation page on our website at reportingufo.org. You can go in there and, and we have a lot of our reports. So next chart, please. The case was in Canada near Niagara Falls. Uh, a gentleman saw a um, a triangular UFO. Now, he says that somebody else saw it at the same time, but we were never clear to that person. So, by that, it's not a great case, you know. Uh, but it became our most famous case because he also said that uh, months later, his workplace, which was a hotel, was visited by these weird guys, very tall, the same height, wearing black suits and black fedoras. Uh, very pale skin, and there was a classic man in black, right out of the mythology. Uh, and you know, it could have been some. Have, these guys could be cast for uh, X Files, so they were. They were, <laughs> uh, and it, multiple people saw them. They, they came in the hotel. They asked for this guy. Uh, they were intimidating, and one woman was in tears after they left because she was so frightened of them. And and we got our investigator tracked down. The hotel security video when they're coming in. Is it on your website? It is on our website. Uh, there it is. Yeah, right there. Click on twelve zero zero one. I'm not going to run you through the whole five minute video, but uh, one of my bellmen approached me and he kind of had a weird look on his face and he said to me, uh, "Can we go in your office and talk?" I brought him into my office and he says, uh, "Something really weird happened here yesterday and and uh, you weren't here." He said. Uh, there's a couple guys in here looking for you. And I said, a couple guys, what do you mean? And he said, well, um, this is really hard for me to say. He said, but there's a couple really strange looking men that were here and they kind of freaked everybody out and they were asking questions about you. And of course, now I'm getting a little bit nervous and I'm like, what are you talking about? And he said, well, they were, he goes, I don't know how to describe them except for extremely odd looking. They were really, really tall. He said, and they were identical height. They were the exact same height. They were wearing the exact same clothes and they had the exact same faces, like they were twins. And he said they were wearing black suits, black trench coats. They were wearing like the old fashioned uh, Federal hats. They had extremely, extremely pale skin. 
And he said they came in and they looked around a little bit and they asked for you. And I said, I'm sorry, he's actually not working today. And it seemed like they didn't believe me. So they started to walk around the hotel and shortly after they went to the tour desk and he goes, I got busy. I started to have to bring cars around and get luggage. And by the time I came back, they were gone. But he goes, they freaked me out. And I really wanted to tell you that there were these weird guys in here looking for you. So of course, now I'm a little bit skeptical and a little bit freaked out all at the same time. So the first thing I do is I run into my security office because I know how to work the security system. And I rewound the cameras and sure enough, there, here comes two gentlemen through the front door looking exactly how he described. Then the next day, I was talking with my uh, tour guest, and one of them um, asked to talk to me. She came in my office, the same as my bellman, and she said, I-, I need to tell you about something that happened. I heard that you heard that there were some men looking for you. And I said, yes. And she said, They asked a few questions about you, and they said strange things that I didn't understand. And they were talking about governments and conspiracies, and none of it made any sense to me. But she goes, they were very, very scary. And I said, well, why were they scary? And she said, they had no facial hair, none. She said they had no eyebrows, no eyelashes, nothing. Their hair looked like they had a wig on like it was attached to their hat, like it wasn't even real. And she said, and the scariest thing, their eyes were so big and so blue that they almost hypnotized me a little bit. And she goes, and you're going to think I'm crazy when I tell you this, but I swear they knew what I was thinking. I swear, and I don't think I'm crazy, but I don't even know how they could do it and I don't know why I'm even telling you this. She goes, so I started to think about things other than you and I don't even know if it worked. And she started to cry and she said one more thing before she left. She said, these men, they didn't blink. Not once did I see them blink. Um, Marcia Barnhart, who was our investigator, also put this together. She, she likes doing these case summary videos. This is our most famous case. It went viral in uh, lots of places. And um, I just brought this one up because I wanted... This is an example of some of the weirder cases we worked. It's not... We don't know who these guys are. And we don't have any, any conclusion about who they are. Uh, it could be a hoax. One thing you have to remember about hoaxes is that hoaxes are no good unless they really look like they're impossible to do. Right? So they have, you have... It's like a magic trick. It has to be harder than it looks like the trick is worth. Right? So, um, next chart, please. I don't want to spoil on that one. This is one that I spent a lot of time on, case 12058. Uh, this guy has seen a lot of UFOs. He's also um, had a lot other very strange experiences. Um, this case involved a very small object that he found one day embedded in his arm after having a very weird dream. His father uh, is a, a doctor and rather skeptical gentleman, uh, kind of dismissed it, but his father had saw the object, uh, as did other members of the family. So we're sure the object existed because we have multiple independent witnesses, some of whom didn't want it to exist, <laughs> you know. And uh, we, we, we uh, said his witness was just credible. And witness was judged credible. That's the correct terminology there. Uh, he was very troubled by his experience. I, when I spoke to him, he was trembling when he recounted one of his experiences, I, I, we we think he what he we think that he's honest about what he remembers. Why he remembers it, we can't say. But the, the small wire-like object was put in a. Uh, he put that in. He wanted to keep it. He, uh, he wasn't sure what he was going to do with it, but he wanted to keep it. So he, he put it in a little uh, polyethylene Ziploc bag, you know, like snack bag, uh, or a sandwich bag, and the next morning. He had the bag, but the uh, the object was gone, and this was a little hole, which was about the same shape and size as the object in the corner of the bag. I spent a lot of time in that bag <laughs> and trying to reproduce the damage to the bag. I, at first, I was sure it was out, so he had just taken it and torn it and, 
And then say, oh, look, it's, it's missing. But why would you do that? It makes no sense. And another thing is that you cannot replicate that by tearing it or cutting it. Uh, and so I worked harder. And I've got a video, uh, another video on this case as well, which Marsha put together, but mostly featured my, my work. And uh, it was difficult to reproduce the damage. I got close, but not with any kind of method that I would think anyone would use to, to remove the object. So, uh, again, we don't reach any conclusion about that. We just say it's a, we don't have an explanation. And uh, we have a video report. We have a summary and also a written report for that. The next, next chart, please. 8010, this is a really great case. I, I, I'm running out of time, so I'm going to go kind of faster. This one, it's a great case, but it's a single witness case, unfortunately. Single witness cases could always potentially be um, fab confabulations because you don't have any corroboration. But this guy did a fantastic job of documenting his sighting. Uh, we, we have, um, we don't have a video for this one yet, but we do have, we do have a report. He went straight home after, well, actually he was straight home. He went to the store after the sighting. Then he, because he had to go to the store. And then he came home and immediately documented everything he'd seen uh, and wrote down several pages of notes, which is awesome. Uh, okay, so I won't go into more detail on that, but uh, it, it's, a, it's a very good single witness case, it's, even though single witness cases aren't great. Uh, so anyway, go to our investigations page. Just click on that tab. And all, the, all the public investigations that we have are there. Uh, if there's one you're looking for and we don't have it there, let us know. We'll see what we can do. Uh, next chart, please. Our podcast, I'll just briefly mention that. We don't put it out a lot, but we put it out with uh, a lot of content. When, when it comes out, it's got really good stuff in it. So you just go to apicasefiles.com and you can. we have 15 episodes and 15 conversations so far. Uh, conversation is just a, like a long form conversation, uh, whereas the, other, the episodes are more uh, magazine style. So next, next uh, our video channel, I already mentioned that, uh, and we have a number of different um, collections in, in the video and on YouTube uh, under API case files. Uh, next chart. Okay, contacting us, if you want, you, you go to reportofufo.org, and you get our website. And you'll end up at this tab here, the report of UFO sighting, uh, where you can, if you don't want to file a UFO report, you want to contact us, go over to the contact tab. If you do want to file a UFO report, feel free. It doesn't have to be investigated. You can click do not investigate, and, or actually you can unclick investigate, and it will, uh, we, won't, we won't investigate, but we may contact you just to let you know we have the report. We never spam anybody. When we don't need your email address anymore, we don't use it anymore. If you want to contact us, go there. Or um, I also, uh, if you want to send encrypted email, go to pro, uh, send report a UFO at ferzonmail.com. And that's, that's encrypted. Uh, it's on a Swiss server. So um, if you have something you want to share with us, that you think should be confidential. Uh, next chart, please. Um, so what to do if you see a UFO? I have a video on this. It's one of the first videos on our channel. What to do if you see a UFO? Uh, first thing, if, if you're injured, by all means, get help before you talk, contact us. Uh, we are not psychologists. We are not therapists. We are not doctors. We cannot help you with that. We're not police officers. So if something happened that was bad, get help. Uh, after that, Contact any other witnesses you know of that were present, and don't 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 exchange notes of what we saw. Just get their contact information if you don't already have it. Make a sketch. It turns out there's scientific evidence that making a sketch of something helps you remember it better. Uh, any so uh, better than a photograph, better than anything. Making a sketch. So and if you have photos of video, still make a sketch. Everything you remember about about. Now I didn't want to suggest anything. To put in the sketch, just everything you remember, and everything that was in the field of view that you saw. Make multiple sketches if you need to. Write down all the details you remember, including date, time, direction, etc. Uh, if you have photos or videos, save them in a safe place, straight from your camera phone. No software, no no modification. Uh, we know how to we know how to enhance things if we need to enhance them. And then uh, go to report you. Notice I, it's a 
you, you can use uh, HTTPS, which is a secure link, uh, reportufo.org, and file your report. Okay, 10 minutes. I want you to stay longer if, if you want. Um,